Our topic of discussion in this lecture is going to be the ever-important polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is extremely common, not only in practice, but also on the test. So you'll want to make sure that you have a good familiarity with this disorder, uh, how you diagnose it, how you treat it, uh, because you're going to run into a lot of women who have this. All right, so if you're a family practitioner, no, gyneco no gynecologist in the area, you're going to be treating these women and diagnosing them. As always, we'll start with a vignette. A 22-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of excessive facial hair growth. Lately, she has had to use a razor every few days to get rid of her hair, and she's very concerned about this. I would be too. Apart from this, she is relatively healthy, though on her last annual checkup, she was found to have hyperlipidemia. She's no Paris and has unpredictable menstrual cycles with only five menses per year, which has been the case since menarche. On physical exam, you note terminal hair growth uh, above the upper lip, on the sideburns, neck, and abdominal midline. There's some facial acne as well, as you can see here. And she also happens to be overweight. Her BMI is 29.2. The rest of the physical exam is unremarkable. So this is a classic presentation of PCOS, and because PCOS is so common, you may even just diagnose it just like that, but it's really not enough. Uh, to make a formal diagnosis. So we're going to do some other things because, as we're going to see, PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to exclude some other things here. So we get LH and FSH levels. We find that the LH-FSH ratio is greater than 2. That's going to be very important. If you don't get anything else out of the labs I'm going to talk about here, write down in nice red ink that an LH to FSH ratio greater than 2, that is consistent with PCOS. Not all women who have PCOS have that elevated ratio, uh, but about 60% do, and that is very consistent with PCOS. We also see that the serum testosterone is elevated, uh, and then we also see that the TSH is normal, and that is done because women with Hyper or hypothyroidism can have disturbances to their menstrual cycles, and so we want to rule that out. And then same with uh, with cortisol. That can disturb menstrual cycles. That can also cause a little bit of hair growth, too, uh, as we can see in things like Cushing syndrome. And then the transabdominal ultrasound. Transvaginal would be better, but if you get transabdominal, that's just as good uh, in, in, in most cases if they're obvious enough. Uh, it reveals multiple ovarian follicles bilaterally with predilection for the, prolif uh, for the peripheral ovary, and that's the classic presentation on sonography for PCOS. Okay, so I am going to try to make this short. I don't want to, I could talk for hours about PCOS because there's so many different things to know, but I want to keep this pretty concise, all right? So this is something that was put out there for patient education, but it does give you some important pointers. So PCOS affects 1 in 10 women. It may even be more than that. 10% of women of childbearing age are uh, estimated to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. 50% are undiagnosed. And then 50% of PCOS women will develop type 2 diabetes or prediabetes before age 40. And there's a three times increased risk of developing endometrial cancer. We'll talk about all this in greater detail as we go on. And these are some of the common signs and symptoms. So irregular periods, we saw that in our patient. Excessive facial and body hair, we saw that in our patient. Severe acne, we also saw that in our patient. Small cysts in the ovaries, which you can see with sonography. Weight gain or overweight, you see that in our patient. And then other things like male pattern, hair loss, infertility, insulin resistance, anxiety, and depression. These are the common signs and symptoms of PCOS. So this is the most common endocrine disorder of reproductive age women. As many as 5 million women in the U.S. have PCOS. The rate has been described between 4 and 12%. The symptoms can vary between ethnicities, but the incidence does not. It's pretty uniform. So if you consider, for instance, that East Asians tend to have less body hair, they're less likely to develop the... Uh, the hirsutism that we may see in other ethnicities. Uh, and so there are some variances in the presentation and the symptoms. Uh, but for the most part, these patients will look quite similar. 
Now, because PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion, you do need to exclude other things before you make a formal diagnosis, but because it's so common, it should be very high on your differential to begin with. So about 60 to 80% of women of childbearing age who present with hirsutism will have PCOS. And that number, that likelihood goes up all the more if you ask her and she has unpredictable menstrual cycles or she's amenorrhea or something like that. Now the etiology of PCOS is unknown. We don't know what causes it. We can't limit it to a certain gene uh, or an inheritance pattern. But we do know it runs in families. Uh, and we know that there are various endocrine and hormonal disturbances which lead to a constellation of symptoms that we've already kind of talked about. So one of the things that's going to be disturbed is the gonadotropins, GnRH, LH, FSH. And what we think is happening is that there is a disturbed GnRH pulsatility. Remember that GnRH pulsatility is very, very important in the woman's normal monthly menstrual cycle in developing the follicle and then ovulating and then repeat. It's the GnRH pulsatility that helps you, uh, it dictates when your LH and FSH levels drop and peak. And so what we do know then is that from polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're going to have abnormal LH and FSH levels. And classically, it's an LH to FSH ratio greater than 2 to 1. Okay? What else? Insulin resistance. So women with PCOS have greater insulin resistance regardless of their body mass. So you can have a lean woman with PCOS, and she could have abnormal uh, glucose screens. So she may even have type 2 diabetes, and you wonder why this lean woman, who we would not expect to have type 2 diabetes, maybe she's only 35 years old, she has type 2 diabetes, but she's lean. Could be PCOS behind that. Uh, so they've done weight-controlled studies and found that out. And this is important because if you have insulin resistance, higher levels of blood sugar, type 2 diabetes, it also increases your risk of developing hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, uh, which are all complications of PCOS. What else? Androgens. So both insulin and uh, LH, they stimulate androgen production by the ovarian theca cell. So remember your follicle, what it's made of. You have your egg sitting inside the antrum. Surrounding that, you have granulosa cells. And then surrounding that, you have theca cells. And the theca cells respond to gonadotropes and when they respond, they make androgens. They then pass those androgens down to the granulosa cells, which have aromatase enzyme, and that can convert it into estrogens. In PCOS, because we have excess LH, we're going to have excess androgen production, and some of the androgen is going to make its way into the circulation and cause some of the symptoms that we see. Uh, now, some of that androgen will get peripherally converted into estrone, and estrone can cause a, uh, a thickening of the endometrial layer. And we'll see that's going to be behind why we have endometrial hyperplasia and hence a three times increased risk of developing endometrial cancer. To compound all these problems, people with PCOS tend to have lower levels of sex hormone binding globulin. And sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG, is a protein that binds to sex hormones. Go figure. And what that does is it essentially inactivates them because only the free sex hormones can, can act. Uh, if you have lower levels of SHBG, then you don't even need to increase your sex hormone levels. Uh, you're going to have more free testosterone, free androgen. And so we get both here. We get increase in androgen, decrease in SHBG, and that's going to lead to much more androgenic activity than we would have otherwise. Now, another thing, I don't think, no, I didn't put it here. Uh, but another thing that's important is something called adiponectin. And adiponectin is something that is responsible for helping us break down fat. People with PCOS have lower levels of adiponectin, and they think that may be partially what's behind the predilection to obesity. About 60 to 80 percent of women with PCOS will be obese. So this is sort of the pathophysiology, this kind of cycle that goes on here. So you have disturbed LHFSH secretion that's going to impair the development of the follicle. 
And that goes behind why this is a polycystic ovary. So normally, you have this orderly F LH and FSH cycle. It allows you to develop the follicle, and then you hit the LH surge, and you ovulate. If this is disordered, the follicle will start to develop, but things don't go exactly right. You don't ovulate, um, so you have chronic anovulation, or you might ovulate only once in a while. But the follicle just does not develop properly. And so you have all these follicles in different stages of development. And that's what we see on sonogram. Now, when you have impaired development of a follicle, but it's still kicking out androgens, as they all do, then you're going to have hyperandrogenism. And that hyperandrogenism is what causes the hirsutism, the acne, the alopecia. Uh, and it's also uh, going to contribute to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, as well as the low adiponectin levels, is going to contribute to obesity. The more obese you are, the more you convert androgens into estrone. And then the more estrone you have, the more likely you are to develop endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, so that's sort of how all these fit in with each other. So the disturbed LH and FSH ratios are going to cause the anovulation and hypoovulation. Now I will tell you this though, that not all women who have PCOS never ovulate. Some of them do ovulate, uh, but we consider it oligoovulation or hypoovulation. And that's when they have less, uh, that coincides with oligomenorrhea, where they're having less than eight periods per year. Now with all this, because there is estrogen, but no progesterone, Okay, very little progesterone in PCOS. Why is there little progesterone in PCOS? Where do we get progesterone from? It comes from the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is the follicle after it ovulates. It sticks around in the ovary and then begins making progesterone. If you're not ovulating, you're not making progesterone because you don't form a cor corpus luteum. So the progesterone levels in PCOS are quite low. And so you have unopposed estrogen. And that unopposed estrogen, again, is going to lead to this abnormal menstruation down here. So that's not only because you have increased estrone, but also because you have reduced progesterone. Um, and then the increased androgens, so that should be relatively straightforward. So you get the hirsutism, hair growing in places where you would expect it to be growing on a 15-year-old boy in puberty. So sideburns, uh, upper lip, chin, belly. They get acne. Why acne? Because androgens increase the production of sebum. Sebum can clog pores and that can cause uh, infection. Male pattern balding. Why? Because you have testosterone. Certain hair follicles express 5-alpha reductase. Remember what 5-alpha reductase does? It converts testosterone to DHT and that can cause the balding pattern, the male pattern balding. So they can get a receding hairline they get frontotemporal balding, where you get that widow's peak, or they can lose their hair in the occiput, in the back of their head. And dyslipidemia is associated with increased androgens as well. That's why we see dyslipidemia in people that take anabolic steroids. Insulin resistance can cause acanthosis nigricans on the skin. I don't have a picture of that here, but you can look it up. It's pretty obvious, it's sort of brown velvety skin. And then type 2 diabetes, of course. And then, as we talked about, the low adiponectin levels can cause obesity. There is a set of criteria to diagnose PCOS, it's called the Rotterdam Criteria, and this is only one of a group of criteria sets that you can use, but this is the one that I see the most commonly, and I think this is the one that would probably be used on your test. So you have to have at least two of these three criteria. Oligo or anovulation, which you can just track with her menstrual uh, cycles. Hyperandrogenism which you can go based on symptoms, and then polycystic ovaries identified sonographically. So it's not difficult to, to fit into uh, this criteria because you only need two of them. And you can see most women who present with PCOS will have at least obvious signs of hyperandrogenism. And then at that point, all you have to do is an ultrasound and polycystic ovaries are pretty obvious on ultrasound. It doesn't take a very skilled sonographer to determine them. Now, like I said, PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So depending on how the patient presents, you may need to, uh, you, you may need to rule some other things out. 
First, I want to just bring up one quick fact here. Hirsutism, where you grow that terminal hair, is not the same as hypertrichosis. You'll hear that word thrown around other places. Hypertrichosis is where you grow that vellus hair, which is that wispy, sort of blondish, soft hair. That can come from different drugs. Uh, I believe it can, uh, dilantin, phenytoin, the anti-epileptic drug can cause it, minoxidil can cause it. So there's different, uh, some of the different drugs can cause hypertrichosis. Don't confuse that with hirsutism, okay? Just want to point that out right now. All right, that being said, uh, you should rule out other etiologies based on the presentation. So if a woman comes to you and she says that I'm going four or five months without my period, I'm only having three or four periods a year, or maybe I'm not having any periods, then you need to rule out certain things. So prolactin secreting tumor, prolactin can uh, interfere with periods. Hyper or hypothyroidism would cause you to ovulate less. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, where you're not making gonadotropins, and so you're, you're essentially in a prepubescent state, more or less. And then premature ovarian failure. And there are different labs that you can get. Get your LH, FSH levels, get total testosterone levels, get estradiol levels. Obviously, thyroid function tests can help put a picture on this. And then hyperandrogenism. So this is obviously a different presentation. This is where you're getting uh, the hirsutism, male pattern baldness. Uh, this can be things like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome, androgen secreting tumors, uh, which can be either on the ovary or on the adrenal gland, or exogenous androgens, which you may see in women athletes who are doping. Now, I will say that if you have an androgen secreting tumor, you're going to see much more dramatic, a much more dramatic picture, not just hirsutism, you're going to see frank virilization. And that can be things like clitoromegaly, increased muscle mass, um, the breasts can shrink down, you can get a deepening of the voice. That's virilization. Virilization meaning man, becoming a man. Uh, that's what that means. Vir is the Latin word for man. Uh, but uh, that is totally different from the hirsutism that we see in polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's much more mild. Here, uh, virilization is, like I said, all those more dramatic things, and that should cue you off towards an androgen-secreting tumor as opposed to polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this is our differential. I know I put CAH here twice, but this is the differential. So depending on how the patient presents. Now, if they have both oligoanovulation and hyperandrogenism, then you're almost certainly dealing with PCOS because there's not much overlap here. And that's probably why that would fit the criteria. Go back here, you have both oligo and uh, oligo anovulation and hyperandrogenism, you've satisfied the Rotterdam criteria. So at that point you really don't need to do a differential. So this is some of the things that you can do for your workup. Get an FSH LH level, that will uh, cue you in on PCOS. You can get a ratio there can also help you if you think it might be hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Uh, and then uh, TSH can point you towards a thyroid issue, prolactin for prolactinoma. Uh, DHEAS and free testosterone will help with those androgen secreting tumors. 17-hydroxyprogesterone would be something that we would see elevated in uh, a 21-hydroxylase deficiency because this is sort of... Uh, before that enzymatic block. And then a lipid profile. You wouldn't necessarily get a lipid profile as part of your initial workup, but if you diagnose a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome, you want to get a lipid profile on her because you want to see if she's dyslipidemic, and if she is, you may start her on a statin. Transvaginal sonography should be performed to visualize the ovaries. Okay, and so what do we get out of it? We get this sort of chain of pearl uh, appearance in the ovaries. So note that you have these follicles, and the follicles tend to sit around the periphery of the ovary. So these are all active follicles, and they can all be secreting androgens, and that's why these women get that. Okay, so they have their theca and granulosa cells are being stimulated by LH and FSH, and that's going to cause them to put out androgens. 
note that they're still there because they haven't ovulated. Okay, once they ovulate, then they become corpus lutea, and the corpora lutea will make progesterone. These women won't have progesterone as women without PCOS do. Now this looks a lot like the theca lutein cysts, but remember that the theca lutein cysts are going to appear in a much different population. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, your typical picture is going to be the woman with uh, menstrual irregularities. Uh, she's usually overweight, maybe hirsute. Uh, on the other hand, women with theca lutein cysts, they're typically women who have been taking clomiphene for in vitro fertilization to stimulate their eggs. Uh, they just had a multifetal gestation. Maybe they have gestational trophoblastic disease, anything that increases the HCG. Uh, so uh, different picture with the theca lutein cysts, but quite similar in appearance on sonography. What do we do for management? If a woman has mild symptoms, she can be managed with observation alone. Now, interestingly, and if you go back to that, uh, that diagram, you notice that having excess fat really causes problems and exacerbates your symptoms of PCOS. Women who are thinner and have PCOS often have much more mild symptoms. And in a lot of cases, these women can be managed with observation alone. But larger women or women with more severe symptoms a lot of times they're going to require some kind of medical management to improve their quality of life. And the cornerstone of medical management is combined oral contraceptives, where you have an estrogen and a progesterone component. And this is useful because what do you do when you're giving this? You are blocking stimulation of the ovary. And by blocking stimulation of the ovary, you're not going to have follicles putting off uh, putting off androgens because you don't have the LH and FSH levels anymore and so the uh, the theca cells are not going to be putting off androgens and that itself is going to ameliorate a lot of the symptoms uh, like the hirsutism and uh, and even insulin resistance to a certain degree. So combined oral contraceptives are where we go first. Helps reduce androgens by suppressing GnRH release as well as LH and FSH release and then the progestin component of the oral contraceptive will also help because it will reduce endometrial proliferation. Remember, endometrial proliferation is from estrogen. Progesterone sort of stabilizes it. Uh, and so it is unopposed estrogen that we see in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Is, and that is what confers the increased risk of endometrial neoplasia and ultimately cancer. So we do this in two steps. First of all, we understand that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome likely have a thickened endometrium, and so we want to induce a withdrawal bleeding, and we do that by giving progesterone. So you can give Provera uh, 10 milligrams every day for 10 days, or 10 milligrams twice a day for five days, doesn't matter. Or you can give Prometrium, micronized progesterone, which is 200 milligrams each day for 10 days. Okay, then what happens then is you stop suddenly stop giving the, these progestins and they'll go into a withdrawal bleed. So the reason PCOS women don't get their periods as normal is not because they don't have an endometrial layer or because their endometrial layer is not getting large enough. The problem is that they don't secrete progesterone because they're, they're not ovulating. They have no corpus luteum to create progesterone and so they never go into the progesterone withdrawal because remember after 14 days the corpus luteum stops creating progesterone you go into pro progesterone withdrawal and you get necrosis and sloughing off of the uh, of the endometrium so they're not getting that because they don't make progesterone to begin with so the idea is if you give them progesterone and then you stop it they'll go into a withdrawal bleed you're you're, you're mimicking nature here once you do the withdrawal bleed then you can introduce oral contraceptives. And we prefer to use the combined oral contraceptives uh, with both the estrogen and the progesterone component uh, because it will give all those beneficial effects uh, as to reduce the androgens. Uh, and that will help with the hirsutism and acne. These are the three that are most commonly used. This is the one I've seen most commonly in my patients, ethanoestradiol drospirinone. That's also known as Yaz or Yasmine. Uh, this is really, really, really good uh, also for, for getting rid of the acne.
but any of these are good, uh, and these in particular are, are good because these progestin components have very low androgen uh, reactivity. If for some reason you can't give the combined oral contraceptives, you can just give progestins alone. Uh, you're just going to be giving uh, either the Provera or Deprovera, uh, or you can give the Prometria. And uh, the problem, though, with this is you're still going to have ovarian uh, stimulation. And so while this will certainly reduce your risk of developing endometrial cancer, this is not going to get rid of the hirsutism or the acne. Okay, so if you do the combined oral contraceptives or whatever, and you still find that you have hirsutism or acne and you want to get rid of it, there are other things you can do specifically geared towards managing uh, these symptoms. So for hirsutism, you can use a flornithine. I'm not exactly sure how it works. I do know, though, that a flornithine is also used in African sleeping sickness, uh, which is an infectious disease. But a flornithine is used topically. It basically kills the hair. Uh, so this is marketed as Venica. I uh, had a, a farm specialist come in a few years ago and uh, try to peddle this. Spironolactone is an anti-androgen. Remember, though, that this is also a potassium-sparing diuretic, and so you don't want to take this with an ACE inhibitor or with potassium supplements as it can precipitate a hyperkalemia. And then you can also do surgical removal, like laser hair removal. Acne. What do you do for acne? Even though I put it second, I think this would, should be the first place you go. So topical benzoyl peroxide and topical antibiotics. Why would you want to do this first? Well, really, the real problem behind acne in PCOS is the same thing for anybody else. It's sebum that gets into the skin, blocks the pores, you have some bacteria down there, now the bacteria can proliferate and cause an infection. It's really no different than anybody else other than it's just they have extra hormones that are making extra sebum. If you can get around that by dissolving the sebum in the benzoyl peroxide and then introducing an antibiotic. Uh, so you can do either benzoyl peroxide alone, or you can do it in conjunction with a topical antibiotic like clindamycin or erythromycin. I think this would be the best. Why? It's safe. Now, on the other hand, the topical and oral retinoids, they have some level of safety, but the problem is that they are highly teratogenic. So these women need to be on contraceptives, and of course, you're going to need to do a pregnancy test before you prescribe them. Other therapies that you can do include luprolide, that's a GnRH agonist. The problem with luprolide, however, is that it can uh, induce sort of a menopausal state, a uh, postmenopausal state, and so if you take this too long, it can decrease your bone mineral density. So you don't want to take this too long. Um, I suppose, you know, there are in some cases, I believe you can give luprolide and then some supplemental estrogen uh, to try to get around that. Um, I think they call that add back therapy, uh, but uh, try to avoid this one. Uh, metformin you can use for insulin resistance, and it's, there's actually been studies showing that if you give metformin to women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, some of them will resume or uh, acquire a more normalized uh, ovulation. And so it might actually even help with their fertility too, uh, though there have been studies that have contradicted that as well. And that just goes to show how insulin resistance may be a key factor in a lot of these symptoms. And of course, if she's dyslipidemic, you want to give statins. So a torvastatin, simvastatin, whatever. Uh, you, want, you want to make sure though, because this is, uh, dyslipidemia can cause all sorts of problems, coronary vascular disease, etc., which can raise her risk of heart attack and stroke and all that stuff. So you want to keep a close eye on it because there's a very, very increased risk of dyslipidemia with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Complications. So as mentioned, dyslipidemia. Dyslipidemia is present in 70% of patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it stands to reason then that cardiovascular disease is also going to be a big complication from PCOS. We mentioned endometrial neoplasia. They have a three-time relative risk for endometrial neoplasia. And then obstructive sleep apnea. This is interesting. This is with weight match controls. 
So you could have a lean woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome and then a lean woman who doesn't. You would think none of them have a huge risk of obstructive sleep apnea because obstructive sleep apnea is typically from being overweight. But there must be something else behind it because even women who are not overweight and have PCOS, they still have a 30 to 40 increased risk of developing sleep apnea. Obstetrical complications, as mentioned, include infertility, subfertility. Usually that's going to be due to anovulation or oligoovulation. Early miscarriage, the rate is about 30 to 50 percent miscarriage in the first trimester, uh, as compared to about 15 percent of the general population. And then there's a three-time relative risk for all of these things here, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, and perinatal mortality. Uh, so I believe that's all I have for you here. If you have any questions, uh, write me a note below. I will try to answer it as quickly as I can. I'll see you next time.